Thank you. Sure have one. Anyway, um, so this is uh, our first CCU Embry Cobras uh, seminar. Our Cobra speaker. So Cobras, uh, very clever acronym. Coastal Biomedical Research Activity Seminars. Uh, so throughout the course of CCU Embry, which should last the next four years, hopefully longer, we're going to be having speakers from both inside the university and outside come give a talk on biomedical research topics. So today, our first speaker in this series is Dr. Dan Williams. So Dr. Williams is in the biology department. Many of you have for genetics, or are ducking in for genetics, one of the two. Um, so he got his BS from Gonzaga University in 1995. He went on to get his PhD in uh, biology from the University of Utah in 2005. He then did a postdoc for a few years at Yale in uh, the labs of Mark ha uh, Hammerland. Uh, did some teaching and then came to Coastal, uh, same year I did. It was a good year in 2012. And uh, last year he was awarded the uh, South Carolina Embry Target Faculty Award. So he has been able to devote more time to research and uh, been able to pay students <coughs> to work in his lab for the last year and for the year to come. So he's going to talk to us about his research uh, with the Elegance. So, Dr. Williams. Thank you. Uh, so, um, uh, when I checked my calendar, I realized it's Friday, and it's Friday afternoon, and I'm spent, and I'm assuming everybody else is as well. So, uh, informal is a good thing, and so if you have a question as we're going, just holler. If you want to make a pithy comment, great. Okay? So, we're, we're completely informal today. Okay? Um, uh, so, uh, uh, what I've got is I've got two uh, uh, independent research stories um, that have uh, uh, common underlying themes. Okay, and so the first research story is uh, um, uh, using this tool, C. elegans, uh, to look at uh, how reactive oxygen species cause neurodegeneration. Okay? Uh, and then the second uh, uh, story is about this inherited metabolic disorder called galactosemia. Okay, so there's two, they're, they're pretty distinct. And, and pretty uh, uh, disparate, but the underlying themes to both of them are, number one, using this little guy, and this guy is, is called C. elegans, and uh, I want to hopefully convince you that it's a really, really good genetic model system to get at certain things, specifically these things. And then the second underlying theme is just my approach to answering these questions, and that I use a, a genetic mutant analysis to try to get at what's going on within the organism or within the cell. Okay. So uh, uh, two different stories, both that have the same underlying theme. All right, so um, neurodegeneration, uh, it happens. It's not good. Uh, you've probably heard of, of different neurodegenerative diseases, um, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, uh, uh, ALS, Huntington's. Um, neurodegeneration is a bad thing. You may have personal experiences with it. Um, it has huge economic and social and emotional cost. And the thing about it is that the, what goes on at the cellular level or the molecular level, when neurons degenerate, and these are in your brain, there are all these neurons, when they degenerate, it's not really clear what is happening at a cellular level. Right? People know sort of triggers of degeneration, and they know a little bit about it, but the, the underlying <laughs> cellular pathology is, is really not well understood. Okay. And it seems to me that if you can understand what's going on at a cellular level, then you have the chance to hopefully block those things that are occurring, and that may give rise to slowing progression of uh, different neurodegenerative diseases. All right, so this is the broad question that, that uh, 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 a broad question that I'm interested in. And it becomes even more interesting when you look at neurons relative to the rest of the body. Okay, so um, uh, do you guys want to sit over here where you can maybe see a little bit better? If you want to, feel free. Okay, so um, this is a, a PET scan. Uh, and a PET scan measures the amount of radioactive glucose that is taken up by certain tissues. And so over here is an individual, this is an x-ray of them, and this is the PET scan of them. And where there are big black spots within this individual is spots where glucose has been taken up. 
Okay? And if you'll notice, where it's really, really blazing is up in the brain. Okay? So uh, uh, the brain uses a vast majority of all of the glucose that you consume. And so what happens when the brain uses glucose is glucose is converted into energy. Uh, and uh, uh, the ultimate step of this is the electron transport chain. And uh, uh, perhaps from cell, you remember there are all these complexes and electrons go through. And I don't remember the names of any of these. But you get these electrons that are these high energy electrons. And they go through the different complexes. And that drives protons through. And the ultimate uh, uh, end product is going to be water. Okay. But these high energy electrons, as they're going through the electron transport chain, what can happen is they can get shunted and they can get diverted and they cannot make it all the way through the train. And they can end up interacting with molecular oxygen to form these things called reactive oxygen species. Okay. Reactive oxygen species have an unpaired electron at the end of them and they're harmful. Right. So as their name implies, they're highly reactive. They can react with other macromolecules within the cell. Too much of them causes oxidative stress. Way too much can cause cell death. Okay. So reactive oxygen species are a bad thing. The brain undergoes a lot of metabolism. Reactive oxygen species are a natural byproduct of metabolism. <coughs> and it's not surprising that... Welcome. Hi, come on in. Okay. that reactive oxygen species have been implicated in different types of neurodegeneration. Okay, so there's different things that can trigger production of reactive oxygen species in addition to normal metabolism. Uh, there's protein aggregation, can get rid of antioxidant defense, things that get rid of reactive oxygen species. Or if cells get too excited, this can produce reactive oxygen species. And reactive oxygen species can give rise to neurodegeneration through mechanisms that we don't understand. This is what I want to get at. I want to get at what goes on between the time reactive oxygen species are present. What are they doing to trigger neurodegeneration? And the way that I do it is I use uh, uh, this little guy. So this is C. elegans. So this is, is uh, the model organism that I use. This is an adult, a young adult worm crawling on the surface of a plate. This is what they look like. And it's a great model system for certain questions. Okay. And the reason why it's really, really good is, number one, it's a powerful genetic system. Okay. It's really easy to make mutations in different genes. Okay. Number two, their nervous systems are well characterized and well established. So worms are, uh, they have an invariant uh, nervous system. Adult worms have exactly 302 neurons, nothing more, nothing less. Okay, and we know what each of those neurons is, what it's connected to. Okay? So it's really, really well established and studied at that level, and so we can manipulate those neurons. It's really easy to grow them. They grow on these plates eating bacteria. You can make 100 plates. You can grow thousands and thousands of worms. Um, and so they're really, really easy to manipulate. We can also make transgenic animals. We can make worms that express any given fragment of DNA or any gene that we want. It's really easy to introduce DNA into the worms, and now they'll express that DNA and produce whatever protein you want. And for the purposes that will become apparent in a little bit, they're transparent, and you can see through them. All right, so I said that the uh, um, nervous system of worms is, is really, really well characterized. Okay? Um, and uh, uh, neurons come in different flavors. There's different types of neurons. And they can be classified based upon the neurotransmitter that they have. And the neurotransmitters are going to have different roles in synaptic connections and synaptic communication between neurons. The nervous system, the, the type of neurons that I'm interested in are called the GABA neurons. You can see how that Okay? And these GABA neurons, there's a total of 26 of them. Okay? And they uh, uh, are involved in locomotion of the worm. And they are involved in relaxation of muscles. Okay? So these are inhibitory uh, uh, neurons, inhibitory motor neurons. They release the neurotransmitter GABA, which will relax muscles when the, the, the neurotransmitter binds to muscles. So I've got an outline of a worm up here, and all of these blobs are neuronal cell bodies. 
right? GABA and neuronal cell bodies. There's a couple in the head, but then the ones that are interesting to me are all of these that are here called the D-type motor neurons, okay? And they're all located in what's called the ventral cord. So this is, is along the ventral part of the worm. So if, if I was like laying on the ground, it would be right here. Okay? They're all along there. And the blobs are cell bodies. And the cell bodies send out processes, axons or dendrites from the neural cell bodies, and then they send other processes called commissures circumferentially around the worm, right, up to the top, to the dorsal cord, and they're gonna have synaptic contacts with muscles that are located on the top of the worm and on the bottom of the worm. And what these guys do is they will synapse onto muscle cells and they'll trigger the muscle cells to relax. And they're involved in normal locomotion, so worms, you saw the worm was swimming like so. Okay, that's it is contralateral excitation of one muscle at the same time that the opposite muscle on the opposite side of the worm relaxes. And that's what allows these body bends to occur. And the GABA neurons mediate that relaxation of the muscle cells that allows for normal locomotion. You can get rid of GABA neurons in worms and they still live. Okay? Unlike humans, you can't get rid of human GABA neurons, but you can get rid of worm GABA neurons and they still live. They don't, they're not required for eating or reproduction, just locomotion. What I've got here is I've got the GABA neurons are labeled with the uh, fluorescent protein GFP. Okay, so uh, um, uh, these are, uh, uh, GFP is being expressed under control of a GABA specific promoter. Each of these big blobs here represents one cell body, and then the commissures are going up and they're synapsing and forming a cord up on the top of the worm. The reason why I like to use the GABA neurons is, like I said, they've got this, this specific locomotion defect, and it's really easy to see what happens to worms that don't have GABA neurons. So normal worms, like most people, don't like to get punched in the nose. Okay, so here was a regular wild type worm. It was crawling around, and then I came in with this uh, uh, pick that I have. This little uh, uh, pick here. I'm going to pop it in the nose. It doesn't really like it, and so it, it responds to that stimuli and it backs up. Okay, that's a wild type response. If you get rid of the GABA neurons. Okay, the GABA neurons are no longer there. It can't mediate the relaxation of the muscle cells. Okay? And so what happens is all the muscle cells will contract when it's stimulated rather than uh, uh, relax. And what happens is the worms, it's called shrink. So if you hit them on the nose rather than backing up, they go all their muscles contract because, and they can't relax because they don't have GABA neurons. And so it causes this very uh, uh, specific shrinking phenotype that you might be able to see did everybody see it? Okay. Oh, you guys are all, all experts in worms. Okay. So we can use this. We can use this assay to measure what the GABA nervous system is like. Right? If they're shrinking, they don't have a GABA neurons. If they're not shrinking, they do. Okay, so this is, is the, the tool that I'm going to use. But I said at the very beginning that my interest was in reactive oxygen species and what it does for neurodegeneration. And uh, when I was a postdoc, I developed a tool, I actually took a tool from somebody else, to cause reactive oxygen species. And the name of this tool is called Killer Red. Okay, so Killer Red is a fluorescent protein. It looks something like this. So this is the crystal structure of it. And the way fluorescence works is uh, a photon of light will come in and it will excite electrons that are in the middle of the fluorescent protein within this chromophore. And then those excited electrons, when they return back down to the ground state, will emit another photon. Okay, and that's what fluorescence is. So if you ever looked at the fluorescent scope, you hit it with one wavelength of light and then you're viewing it at another wavelength of light. Okay. Killer red looks a lot like GFP, another fluorescent protein. Only, rather than being really, really good at fluorescing, the excited electrons, when they get hit with the photon of light, can get out and they can interact with oxygen to produce reactive oxygen species. <coughs> okay? So GFP and killer red, the overall structure of them is very similar. They've all got these beta barrels. 
but GFP has uh, uh, lids and, and bottoms to the barrels that prevent the excited electrons from interacting with oxygen, whereas in Killer Red, the bottom of the barrels and the top of the barrel is open. And so it's exposed, and so that's where uh, uh, oxygen, uh, reactive oxygen species are going to be produced. So like I said, Killer Red uh, uh, gets excited, and then it emits photons. It is fluorescent. It's not as good as other fluorophores, but it's really good at producing reactive oxygen species. And when it does it, it can kill things and it can cause damage. Okay? And so the people who I, I, I took this from, um, they looked at a lot of different other fluorescent proteins, and they expressed them in E. coli cells, and then measured how well these different fluorescent proteins killed E. coli cells. Okay? And here's a graph of the relative uh, toxicity of different fluorescent proteins, and you see that killer red has this really, really high uh, uh, toxic effect compared to other fluorescent proteins. Not only that, but the effect, the uh, uh, effect of the phototoxicity is dependent upon the intensity of illumination. Right? If you hit it with low levels, it's not going to produce as much. It's not going to be as toxic. So, because this thing can be activated by light, by hitting it with, with a green light of a certain wavelength, and it's a protein, right? we can express it in certain tissues and only certain tissues, and then we can activate it when we want. And so it's a means of having spatial and temporal control over the production of reactive oxygen species. I can say, I want to put reactive oxygen species in this particular tissue type, and I want to turn them on at this particular time and see the effects of that. Yes, sir. How do you specify which tissue type has the pillar red? You make a construct, such as this, that has a specific promoter in it that is a tissue-specific promoter, Okay, so in this case, the GABA-specific promoter is the thing that is going to pump GABA into synaptic vesicles. It's only expressed in those GABA neurons. I took that and I took the coding sequence for killer red, put it under control of this promoter, and now I have killer red that's only expressed in the GABA neurons. Uh, we also did some other things. So um, we added some introns to it to help with expression. Um, I'll just, killer red is a completely synthetic molecule. It doesn't exist in nature. Um, the people who made it took an existing uh, uh, fluorescent protein and, and did uh, um, uh, sort of in, uh, in vitro evolution to, to develop one that's really phototoxic. And so the sequence is, is not natural. Okay, so I've, I've made these worms that express killer red in the gamma neurons as well as other places, but I'm just going to be talking about the Gallup ones. And when I do the experiment and illuminate these worms that have killer red, it causes a, a, a high level of uh, shrinkers. Okay, so I'll walk you through uh, uh, this whole figure. Okay. What it is, is I'm measuring the percentage of worms that shrink in response to different treatments. And so this first bar over here, this is on 47 mutants. These are mutants that don't have GABA. Okay? So they don't have, uh, uh, they can't put GABA into synaptic vesicles, and there's a very, very high penetrance all of the worms shrink. Okay? If you take regular worms, they don't shrink, regular wild type worms, and this is the initial uh, uh, movies that I showed you. Not only that, but they don't shrink even if you hit them with light. Okay, so I've got either they're going to be either kept in the dark or they're going to be illuminated with, with green light. Wild type worms don't do anything. If I take worms that are expressing GFP in the GABA neurons and hit them with light, eh, there's a little bit of shrinking, but not very much. Definitely not the same amount as the absence of the GABA neurons. And now if I take killer red worms and I hit them with light, there's a huge dramatic increase in the number of worms that are shrinking but there's not so much if the worms are kept in the dark. Okay. The synopsis to this is when I illuminate killer red in the GABA neurons, it does damage to those neurons and causes the worms to shrink. Other related uh, fluorescent proteins, so this is m it's another fluorescent protein expressed in the GABA neurons. When it gets, and it has the same absorption spectra as killer red. When it gets hit, it doesn't have the shrinking field. That is a very good question, and it depends upon the intensity of the light. 
And that was Tina asking that of you. Uh, it depends on the intensity of uh, light. Um, these initial experiments were done with a, a fancy uh, uh, apparatus and a fancy laser. Um, and so it was very, very short durations. Uh, later on, I'll have other things where we've done it for uh, a bit longer. Sir, would you repeat the question? I couldn't hear it. Sorry. Uh, uh, Tina's question was, how long do you have to hit them with light? How long do you illuminate them for? And, and the short answer is it varies. If a binary situation has a number of animals that shrink, they have shrunk or they don't shrink. Don't you have intermediate phenotypes? There is, yes. There is an intermediate phenotype. Um, it is subjective, and we either just call it or not. Okay. Uh, at this for, for these particular experiments, um, it was hit with a huge amount of light, and so it was pretty yes or no. Um, <laughs> There's another phenotype to the loss of GABA neurons, um, uh, and, and they can't poop. <laughs> so uh, uh, they, the worms get this, this constipated, constipated phenotype. Mm -hmm. And that is more binary because it's the result of one GABA neuron that's involved in this particular process. And so now we're starting to also use that as an assay. Okay. One more question, please. Yes, sir. How did you observe the phenotype for the worms if they were in the dark? Oh, well, we, we, uh, uh, the, the, the uh, uh, dark is, we just didn't put them underneath the bright illumination that we did here, but then we would look at them. Okay. <coughs> All right, so it does get rid of, if, so killer red, activation of killer red, screws with the GABA neurons at a functional level. Okay. And it also at a structural level. Okay, so now this is now uh, uh, GFP of the GABA neurons that are also labeled with killer red, that have either been kept in the dark or illuminated. Okay? And uh, here are the cell bodies, and these are the commissures that go up to the, the top cord, right? and things are nice and intact. And if you look down here, it doesn't look quite as nice. Okay? It, it's the, the cell bodies, number one, there's not the cords that are present in uh, the regular worms. The cell bodies are now rounded and they have a different morphology, and there's a bunch of blebs to the, the commissures, and the, the nervous system is pretty fragmented in him. So not only is it screwing with the uh, 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 structure, but it, or the, the function, but it's also screwing with the structure. Yeah, so uh, uh, going in, you can think of a couple of possibilities. Possibility number one, there's a ton of reactive oxygen species. It's hitting lipids. It's disrupting them. It's hitting uh, uh, proteins of the membrane skeleton. And it's hitting all sorts of stuff, and it's just causing massive damage that gives rise to this. You can also imagine <coughs> that there are pathways of degeneration that are caused by a specific type of insult, right? That, that will initiate a molecular pathway that will result in, ultimately, this phenotype of the degeneration. Okay? And other people have, 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 other, have used other triggers of neurodegeneration to try to dissect what happens as a neuron is de degenerating. Okay? And so uh, uh, here's a couple of uh, different uh, summary figures from a couple of different papers triggering degeneration in different ways. So this top one is triggering it by these uh, excitotoxic channels. So these are constitutively open ion channels that will cause excitotoxicity within the cell. And what they found is that there's this <coughs> signaling from the ER, calcium mediated signaling from the ER, calcium comes out of the ER, and that calcium then initiates a cascade that initiates a degeneration pathway via over here, other uh, uh, calcium-dependent proteases. Okay, so here's another paper where they've got this mutant version of a ribosomal uh, uh, protein that they're expressing, uh, and, and it aggregates, and this aggregation is thought to give rise to a, uh, initiating a, a cellular cascade that's going to result in the production and the release of calcium from the ER that's going to initiate a, a neurodegeneration. <coughs> And both of these uh, uh, papers were using worms to, to get this sort of mechanism. Okay. 
And so, to get back to your question, right, perhaps this is what's going on with the reactive oxygen species, right? That we're getting reactive oxygen species initiates these types of cascades that cause degeneration to occur. I'm going to have a couple of players that I'm going to be talking about, a couple of different genes. One is this one right here. This is called calreticulin. Okay. And calreticulin uh, has a number of different functions within the ER. It functions as a chaperone, but it's also important for calcium homeostasis within the ER. There are two ion channels that I'm going to be talking about. One is this inositol trisphosphate receptor, which is called the ITR1 receptor in C. elegans. And it is a way of calcium getting out of the ER into the cytosol. And then the other one is this thing called the ryanidine receptor, which is also a calcium channel that is involved in getting calcium out of the ER into the cytosol. Okay? So their models, if they got rid of the inositol trisphosphate receptor or the ryanidine receptor, they saw a decrease in the amount of degeneration that was triggered by this type of insult. Okay? And so they said that these things are important for degeneration. The other thing I'm going to talk about is this drug called dantrolone. Dantrolone is an inhibitor of the ryanidine receptor. Alright, so the question I want to get at <coughs> is the initial question that, that um, Dr. Aguirre posed, right? Is, is what do you think is happening when you have the reactive oxygen species to give rise to this phenotype that we see, this degeneration phenotype? And the question is, is this a calcium mediated thing, right? And so I can use, take mutants of these things and see whether or not killer red degeneration occurs in these different mutant backgrounds. And that will help to figure out whether or not calcium is involved in this particular study. Okay. So what I want to do is I want to genetically or pharmacologically disrupt calcium and see what it does to degeneration. So the first thing that I want to do, and this brings up uh, uh, to Tina's thing, how long did you hit him with light? This was this fancy apparatus that I had. Uh, uh, when I came here, I didn't have this fancy apparatus. I'm going to make sure that right, I can get it to go the same amount of <coughs> seed regeneration uh, uh, here that I, I had in the past. And then what we're going to do is we're going to look at these different mutant backgrounds or these different treatments that get rid of calcium and see, make sure that that does not affect the GABA neurons by itself. So we can still look at the same output. Right? If, if our perturbations that disrupt calcium screw with the GABA neurons, we can't really use them to figure out whether or not killer red is screwing with the GABA neurons. Okay? And then we're going to look at degeneration that happens when calcium is altered. Okay? So now the way we do our relations now is uh, uh, we put the worms in the cap of a PCR tube. Okay, so here's a little cap of a PCR tube, and it's underneath the microscope, uh, and we hit it with the uh, 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 Tritzi filters. So this is the green light that's going to activate killer red underneath the, the, the microscope. So the worms are all in this little tiny cap. We load them up with a bunch, put them underneath here for five minutes, and then look at them. <coughs> all right, so one of the first things we did is uh, to look to see that we do have degeneration occurring. That, that using this microscope, using this methodology that we see degeneration, and compared to control worms that are kept in the dark, or just not illuminated, uh, if we do illuminate them, we do see a high level of, of shrinkers relative to unilluminated controls. Uh, here's an image of killer red, right, that it, the, this, it expressed in the GABA neurons. Each of these big yellow blobs is a cell body. I uh, can't really see the commissures, but they're there. And when we look at the uh, uh, neuronal architecture after illumination, there is a uh, disruption. So these are illuminated guys. There's this rounding of the cell body that is, is uh, indicative of um, uh, degeneration occurring. The different cords start to get a little bit fragmented relative to illuminated. So uh, uh, we can cause degeneration <coughs> here. Next, we looked at whether or not different types of genetic backgrounds have a GABA-specific phenotype by themselves. Okay, so the first one I, I'm going to talk about is the uh, UNC68 mutant background. And UNC68 encodes the right receptor that I talked about earlier. So this is involved in getting calcium out of the ER. 
And just looking at it by itself, UNC 68 mutants, they don't move as well, but they don't have a shrinking phenotype. Okay, so if we just measure UNC 68 mutants by themselves, they look closer to wild type than they do to worms that don't have GABA. Okay, so this says that this particular mutant background, if we get rid of the riatin receptor, we still have a functional output that is normal, so we can see whether or not degeneration is occurring to these guys that would give rise to a shrinking phenotype. And so when the experiment was done, we took either wild type worms that are expressing killer red <coughs> or UNC 68 mutant worms that are expressing killer red and either illuminated them or did not illuminate them. And when we do it, what we saw is that there was a similar level of neurodegeneration in the wild type and in the UNC 68 mutant background. And this was different than what we expected. Going into our initial hypothesis, we thought we were going to have the same sort of thing that previous people saw in that degeneration is inhibited and is blocked in UNC 68 mutant backgrounds. But we saw that there's a similar level of killer red mediated in their degeneration in a wild type of UNC 68 mutant background. And so the suggestion to that is that <coughs> this receptor is not involved in mediating degeneration. It's not doing anything. If you get rid of it, degeneration still occurs, and therefore it can't be part of the degeneration pathway. In order to test this a little bit more in depth and make sure, we use drugs to try to inhibit the red receptor. So the drug we use is this thing called dantrolone. Okay, and dantrolone is an antagonist of the red receptor, so it blocks the activity of it. Okay? And uh, we can take worms, keep them in the dark, dump on, <coughs> dump dantrolone on them, or grow them uh, uh, in the presence or absence of dantrolone. And if we give them dantrolone, unrelated to worms don't shrink, okay? and then when we do uh, illuminate them, we see a similar amount of degeneration in worms that are treated with dantrolone as control worms. Okay? And so we have two different ways that we've gotten rid of the right receptor, either by mutants or by blocking it with drugs, and in both cases we see the same amount of neurodegeneration occurring. Okay? And so our overall uh, 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 the conclusion of this is that in our hands, neurodegeneration, needed by reactive oxygen species, is independent of the Ryan receptor, which again is distinct from what other people saw. And so we started to think of how this works. So maybe there's two separate pathways. Maybe there's the initial pathway, cytotoxicity or protein misfolding, that go through this calcium dependent pathway to trigger neurodegeneration. And perhaps reactive oxygen species goes through a calcium independent pathway. Something else is going on, perhaps the necrosis and it's hitting all of the, 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 the lipids or things like that to kill the neurons. That's causing the degeneration. Yeah. I think I missed it, but did you show that in the beginning, showing that killer red actually induces ROS accumulation? I did not show that it does anything for uh, uh, causing ROS accumulation. Did yes. So, yes. So it's both. Well, yes. Uh, so other results. Uh, uh, if we do it in a uh, sod <coughs> one mutant background, mm -hmm. there's increased degeneration. Mm -hmm. Okay. And if we overexpress sod, we can decrease it a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, and other people have have done other things to show that it's superoxide and that there is a a huge production of it. Yeah. We could just like reverse the phenotype and kill the red. Just try to put the antioxidant uh, I have uh, done one experiment uh, with ascorbic acid, and I have suppressed it a little bit. But that's the job. Okay. Um, so, so other people have shown that this red receptor is important for degeneration. In that, if they get rid of the red receptor, degeneration doesn't happen. The results that I just showed shows that if we get rid of the ionic receptor, degeneration still happens. Okay, so we've got something else going on. And so we're going to take a look at other things to make sure that, yes, indeed, it is, whether it's calcium still or whether it's just the ionic receptor that's going on. Okay. And so we're looking at other genes. And so we've got uh, uh, looked at, at mutants in uh, uh, either calreticulin or in the nosolatol trisphosphate receptor, and uh, uh, by themselves, 
right? Without any illuminations, without killer red being present, they don't have a GABA phenotype. So we can still use our, our shrinker output uh, to measure degeneration. <coughs> but then when we do illuminations on these different genetic backgrounds, we do see that there is a reduction in the amount of degeneration that occurs. Okay? It's not super dramatic, it's not a complete suppression, but it is statistically significant. Okay? And so if we have either calreticulin mutants or inositol trisphosphate mutants, we do see that there is a decrease in the amount of degeneration that occurs. Okay. And so this says that it's probably going through some sort of calcium dependent pathway. Right, that these things are important for degeneration because if we get rid of them, degeneration doesn't happen as much. Alternatively, one possibility that could explain these results is that perhaps we get rid of a calreticulin mutant or a nosophosphorus phosphate receptor for whatever reason, maybe that's messing with the amount of killer red that's expressed. Right? If there's less killer red that's being expressed, in these different mutant backgrounds, the prediction is, is that there will be a reduction in the amount of degeneration that occurs. Okay. And so to test that, we tested the levels of killer red a couple of different ways. Uh, we used RT-PCR, RT-QPCR, as well as direct measurements of the fluorescence. And so this is, is um, our uh, uh, results of RT-PCR. Here are the direct uh, CT values, CT curves. The relative expression levels in a cow reticulin mutant and a wild type mutant relative to, or an osmotic phosphate mutant relative to wild type. There's no real change in the levels of expression of the RNA levels. These are the belting curves for reference. And we also measured directly the fluorescence intensity of killer red in these different mutant backgrounds. Uh, and so we looked at a number of different uh, uh, neurons and a number of different animals average amount, there's no real change in the amount of uh, fluorescence intensity. And so it's probably not changing uh, uh, killer red expression levels <coughs> in the mutant backgrounds. And so we're left with a model of what is going on. Okay? And where we're at, or what we think is happening, is that the degeneration does go through calcium, but the different ways of triggering degeneration go through different players. So the model that we have is that reactive oxygen species are directly activating or causing an l ultra phosphate receptor to open. Right? There's an interaction between ROS and this particular receptor, but not the Ryanite receptor. Okay? That ROS is influencing the activity of the l ultra phosphate receptor, causing it to open, that's allowing calcium to get out. The calcium that gets out is now going to go through calcium-dependent proteases, to initiate a neurodegeneration cascade the way other people have seen. Okay. And that if you get rid of cal calreticulin, when we mess with calreticulin, we're screwing with the overall levels of releasable calcium from ER stores. Okay. And so this is our, our working model for what we're seeing for degeneration. Okay. It's a little bit distinct from others, but there are commonalities to it. And what we're working on now is to see whether or not things that are downstream of calcium, right, these calcium-dependent proteases, if they also influence our degeneration that we see, okay, triggered by reactive oxygen species. So uh, uh, there are these calcium-dependent proteases. These proteases will start to chew up things, chew up proteins within the cell. So we're gonna test to see whether or not we see decreases in degeneration when we get rid of these proteases as well. We're also using other drugs to get rid of, uh, to screw with calcium levels, uh, uh, EGTA and BAPTA, so we're gonna mess with uh, calcium levels on, on that end. And we're also starting to look at the difference between acute versus chronic levels of illumination. Okay, so the uh, experiments that we did were these five minute bursts of fairly intense light. Okay, and now we're gonna start to try to dial the intensity back and see if we hit the worms, you know, once a day with low levels to see if we start to see differences in the type of degeneration that's occurring. And so we're going to look to see whether or not uh, uh, there's differences based upon how we, we add the reactive oxygen. How about double mutants? What do you want to do? Knock out both. 
both the uh, uh, RAND interceptor and the IP3 receptor? No, the um, IP3 and the... Uh, Cow chicken? Yeah. Yeah. So you're saying a little Right, so this w is a great way uh, uh, by doing this double mute analysis to figure out if there are two parallel pathways or if it's just one linear thing. Mm -hmm. Yes? I'll put it on the list. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it does. It, it does function as a chaperone that helps with uh, protein folding. Um, uh, it does calcium things and it does other things as well. It does a lot of different things. <coughs> Could you look at the concentration of your, your um, pereases and see if you have like, activated pereases when you have these different scenarios? Mm. So, so uh, uh, if there's a way of measuring the perease activity. Yeah. Uh, yes, that would be awesome. I don't know if there is a way. Um, uh, rather than sort of direct measuring, I would rather try to look at the biological effect of getting rid of it. Yeah. Um, you know, in my lab, we're looking at proteus activity in, in plants, but mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you could possibly use that technique to look at proteus activity in individuals. Maybe. Uh, they're tough. It, it, it's kind of tough to make extracts of yeah. worms, especially uh, if you want to have intact proteins. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, alternatively, uh, uh, overexpress it. Have you measured calcium or calcium release? Uh, no. Um, so one of the things that I, I, I wrote about was using um, uh, um, control. A what? Like a probe to measure calcium? Yes. So there are um, uh, genetically encoded calcium indicators. Um, uh, and somebody has one that's expressed in GABA neurons, um, but he hasn't written back to me to see if I could have it from him. Um, um, yeah, I, I, that, that, to look at calcium levels directly to see, right? One prediction is, is that there's going to be an increase after ROS. Yeah. But I haven't. All right, so, so that was one quick project that, that took a little longer than <coughs> I thought. And so now I'm going to go through really quickly the next project. Okay. Um, uh, and so, uh, again, the, the same sort of theme, right? We're going to use worms, okay? uh, and it, it's a genetic analysis of it. Okay? Um, and this is, is this inherited metabolic disorder called galactosemia. Okay? Uh, so uh, uh, galactosemia... Uh, has a, a, a broad spectrum of uh, symptoms, um, and it ranges from uh, uh, severe symptoms of death um, to other uh, uh, more uh, chronic symptoms uh, that are, are just like not as uh, um, not as severe, but they all are, are have consequences, right? So developmental delay, um, there's a, a reduced fertility, um, and there's neurological issues to patients that have. Uh, galactosemia. Usually galactosemia uh, is treated with redu reduced dietary galactose, um, but even if patients don't do that, they still have these issues. All right. In humans, there are three genes that when mutated give rise to galactosemia, um, and they're called GALK and GALT and GAL. Okay. And um, these are all enzymes that are involved in the processing and the metabolism of galactose. So galactose is a simple sugar. Um, it, uh, uh, it comes from lactose. Lactose is a dimer of glucose and galactose. And the first thing is GALK converts galactose to GAL1-phosphate. And then this other enzyme, GALT, will convert the GAL1-phosphate to glucose-1-phosphate, which will then go into uh, glycolysis. And it does so through this ping-pong mechanism using UDP glucose and converting that into UDP galactose. So if you get, don't have these enzymes, or these enzymes don't work, you have galactosemia. Patients have galactosemia. And it's thought that the reason why they have these severe issues when they're fed galactose is there's buildup of toxic precursors. Okay. But it's not really clear what the long-range symptoms are, what they're caused by. 
right? So even if they're not fed galactose, there's not going to be any buildup of these precursors, they still have underlying issues. Okay. And what I want to do is I want to use worms to understand why patients have these issues, even if they're not fed galactose. Okay. And uh, uh, going into this project, I thought that there has to be a couple of different things if, if worms are going to be a good model to model galactosemia. Number one, they have to have the enzyme. Right? They actually have to have the enzyme. It has to be similar to the human enzyme. And number two is that getting rid of it should mimic the, the symptoms of galactosemia. Okay? In that worms should be sensitive to galactose. They should be slow to grow. They should have reduced fertility. And they should have some sort of neurological and if I can have these things, then I've got a model for galactosemia, and we can start to try to figure out what's going on inside the cell or inside specific tissues <coughs> that might tell us something about the disease. Okay. All right, so the first thing is worms have galactosemia enzymes, right? So they have the enzyme GALT, and this is a protein sequence alignment of uh, uh, the enzyme GALT from different species from uh, C. elegans all the way, or from uh, E. coli all the way through Homo sapiens. And these are the different protein sequences and wherever there are stars indicates 100% conservation from bacteria to humans. Okay, so it's incredibly conserved. Looking through the uh, uh, worm database, I found the enzyme and the enzyme is uh, encoded by this gene ZK1058.3. It looks something like this. So this is the enzyme. This is the, the, the gene for GALT. Not only that, but people have taken the worm and they have made a ton of different mutations in any given gene. And so here is the, uh, the protein. Here's the, the, the coding sequence for the gene. Here are other flanking genes. And all of these little notches below it within the genome indicate spots where there are alleles changes from wild type sequence on different genes within the genome. Okay. And as it turns out, there are one, two, three, four, five, six different change of function alleles within GALT that were produced by this project called the Million Mutation Project. Okay, so there are these six different alleles that are all present within GALT. And one of these alleles is really, really close to the GALT active site. Okay, so this is now the, the spot uh, uh, within the enzyme that is the active site. There's this catalytic histidine, and this catalytic histidine forms an intermediate where it's got the uh, GALT uh, uh, UMP uh, um, glucose bound to it, and then galactose comes along. So this is a critical uh, residue that's important for activity of the enzyme. One of the alleles is this glycine to glutamic acid substitution that's present right here. Okay? And so I've got this allele, it, it's this particular change, it changes this glycine. This glycine is really, really close to this highly conserved active site. It takes a small little amino acid and changes it to a bulky carboxylic acid amino acid. Okay. So, number one, there are, GALT is present in worms, and there are mutants available in GALT. Okay. So what I did is I went ahead and I got these mutants. I got this particular allele. And then I'm going to test to see whether or not it has these mutants. <coughs> and the first thing that I have to tell you about worm biology is that worms develop through different stages. So this is an adult worm. It's got a whole bunch of embryos in it. And the worm lays these embryos that look like this. And the embryos are on the plate. The embryos <coughs> patch through these different larval stages. And it takes about a couple of days for it to go from an embryo to a reproductive adult. And I've got uh, uh, worms on a plate that are crawling around. You might be able to see different sized worms. Right? Here's a little guy versus an adult guy. And there's these little dots here that represent the embryos that are laid on the plate. So it's easy enough to take galactose, add it to the media, and see what it does to this developmental progression. And so the first experiment that I did is I took populations of worms that were synchronized, and I grew them on different types of media that were supplemented with increasing amounts of galactose. Okay? And I either looked at wild-type worms or worms that have that GALT mutation, which I'm just going to call GALT minus worms. 
And once I hit this th critical threshold of uh, uh, galactose, there's this huge, very highly penetrant larval arrestian type. Okay? That worms that are grown on 10 millimolar galactose, or 10 millimolar galactose uh, uh, don't develop past the L1 stage. Okay? They all crap out, whereas wild type worms do just fine. Okay. So uh, uh, these galt mutants are very sensitive to galactose. When I measure them in the absence of galactose, this is just them growing on regular plates, and I measure how many reach adulthood after a fixed period of time and compare that to wild-type worms. What I find is that there's a decrease in the number of worms that reach adulthood, a decrease in the number of gout minus worms that reach adulthood relative to wild-type. Okay, and so my synopsis of that is that they're developmentally delayed. Not only that, but I can look at the total number of offspring that each galt worm has. And I can count how many offspring they have. And as it turns out, galt mutants have fewer offspring than wild type worms do. Okay, wild type worms have around 300 offspring. Galt mutants have a, a, a two thirds of that. And they're uh, uh, they have fewer number of offsprings. Their, their number of offsprings that they have per day is also decreased. Okay, so this is, is the uh, frequency of offspring as a function of day. It's just a reduction in the galt mutants. Right? They have the same sort of time course. They have the same uh, 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 peak of reproductive period, but they have a fewer number of offspring throughout the course of their lifetime. <laughs> Uh, and then the other thing is I did a quick little experiment to look at how well they move. So I did this experiment called a thrashing assay where worms were put in a drop of liquid. And when they're put in a drop of liquid, they thrash back and forth because they don't really like the liquid. They just move back and forth really, really rapidly. And it's a measure of how well their motor neurons are working or, or how well their muscles are working. And I see that galt mutant worms have a reduced thrashing frequency. Okay? They don't thrash as much. They don't move as much. And so this to me suggested some sort of neurodevelopmental delay, there's some sort of neurodevelopmental or neurological defect in these worms that's causing this particular phenotype. Okay, so I think we've hit all of these benchmarks at some level, right? That they do have, they are highly sensitive to the lactose, they do have a developmental delay independent of the lactose, they also have reduced fertility and they have some sort of neurological defects. <coughs> okay. And what we're working on now is, number one, we're trying to make sure that what we're looking at is galt mutants. And we're doing this by trying to take the galt gene and rescuing the mutant phenotype by expressing the galt gene in our mutant background to make sure that it is indeed galt. Uh, with the help of Dr. Uh, uh, Budner, we're looking to see whether or not there's a buildup of toxic precursors in the galt mutant. Okay? So uh, the expectation is that if we get rid of galt, we're going to see a buildup of UDP glucose and a reduction in the amount of UDP galactose. And so he's doing HPLC on worms that lack galt to see whether or not we see a, a buildup of those. And then the final thing that we're doing is looking at the overall nervous system structure using different GFP fluorescent reporters in the galt mutant background to see whether or not the nervous system is grossly abnormal, relatively normal, or if there's anything wrong with the nervous system itself, the structure. And that's the galt project in five minutes. Uh, uh, so um, uh, thank you. Um, uh, this stuff was started. Uh, uh, the killer red stuff was started in Mark Hammerlin's lab uh, when I was a postdoc. Um, this is Monica Driscoll. She's helped me out with a lot of different things, and she uh, uh, some of the, the work on the right receptor and, and the uh, cow reticulin uh, uh, is her work. Um, I'm paid through this grant, uh, and there's a bunch of people that have done uh, stuff in the lab. Uh, the killer red stuff was done by Lindsay and Megan. Uh, uh, Val, Michelle, Morgan, and David did uh, some of the black stuff. So, thank you. Thanks for coming. Uh, second, I don't want diabetes, maybe cookie, or two. <laughs>
four, three, eight, or however many people need to be taken. And this is like this is the first of a seminar series. We're going to have another speaker on October 14th, Dr. Jill Turner from the University of South Carolina's Pharmacy School, and she's going to talk about more neurogenetic stuff. Uh, this time related to smoking cessation and how genetics plays a role in that.